there, my name's Catherine Leyland and I'm part of the primary English and Literacy team at LPDS. And today myself and Stephen Kenyon are going to talk you through some top tips on addressing common errors in writing. So what we're talking about here are our skills for life in writing. So we're thinking about skills for life, not just for SATs. So what we want to do is at the point of marking, reflect on the writing outcomes of your class, focusing on those independent writing outcomes. Then we want to identify common errors which you may be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis across the class. Now, these may be skills which you've been taught in previous year groups, but we're still finding that the children haven't got those skills and knowledge secure. They're still making errors with them. And then we're going to collate a list of these errors. When we've collated a list of the errors, what we want to then do is to create and display bespoke prompts or posters for the working wall tailored to the needs of the class. So you can see on the right hand side there, I've got a year six skills for life example. Now we've got just a few to focus on. So again, these are the common errors that I found within the class and these are my priorities. This is what I want to address and rectify in order to move the children's writing forward. You can see there we've also included some examples from the children, so those red sentence strips. And again, that's really good because the children have got ownership of that display. I'm going to avoid published prompts because if I just download and print one, it will just become wallpaper when I pop it up on the wall. But if I've co-constructed these displays with the children and the children are adding sentence strips to them all the time, then there's a lot more chance that the children will use them effectively in order to address and rectify those common errors. Now, as I've said, I've probably already taught these skills or the children have already been taught them in a previous year group. But guess what? We're going to reteach them. We're going to reteach them explicitly and we're going to do lots and lots of modelling. So I'm going to model the editing. So you can see on the right hand side there, I've got a little um, extract of a child's writing. You can see the common errors. So this one is a spelling error. So again, when I'm doing some model writing, I'm going to model which is the correct spelling and then after after I've modelled, the children are going to edit independently after every single piece of writing, again using my display as a prompt. Now there's been lots of common errors that we've identified in Key Stage 2 writing and as I'm going through these, you, these might ring true with you. You might be thinking, oh yeah, these are definitely an issue um, within my cohort. So in terms of spelling, we've seen lots of homophone errors. So there, there and there, two, two and two, of and off and again those incorrect spellings. In terms of sentence construction, we've seen, so again, some of the basics that should have been taught in previous year groups. So lack of capital letters for names of people or places, numbers written in numerals rather than words, comma splicing. So a comma which has been mistakenly used instead of a full stop, a conjunction or a semicolon. And sometimes words that have been omitted within sentences. So the children aren't going back and rereading their sentences to make sure they make sense. In terms of composition, we've seen some weak vocabulary choices and children that aren't sticking to the intent of purpose and audience. So, for example, the vocabulary isn't quite relevant for the outcome or there's a lack of formality. So what can we do? We again, of course, we want to make this fun. We want to make that learning sticky. So we've just got a few ideas um, for some multi-sensory activities that should help to address and rectify these common errors. So in terms of full stops in capital letters for names, places and the personal pronoun I, there's lots of things you can do during your shared reading activities that will help the children. So we want to make sure obviously that we've got our full stops correctly. So we might have a beach ball or a bouncy ball. So something that's nice and soft. You can have somebody up at the front and every time there's a full stop. So as you're doing a shared read, as you're reading aloud, when there's a full stop, the child can bounce that ball. We want everybody to be part. So everybody else that's on the carpet might be doing a kung fu action. So they might be punching the air whenever there's a full stop. You might have somebody at the front with a bucket full of full stops. So whenever you get to the end of a sentence, a child can hold up 
um, a full stop in there. In terms of the capital letters, so after the full stops, when there's a, a capital letter for the beginning of a sentence, or we've got a capital letter for a name, a place, or the personal pronoun I, we could be have somebody at the front that's doing, again, a Kung Fu action for our capital letters. The rest of the class could be standing up so that everybody's involved, or you might even have a capital letter crown that somebody at the front is popping on the head every time there should be a capital letter. And hopefully that will make that learning nice and sticky. Then we'll want to apply that knowledge obviously into our unit. Um, so using a quality text, and I've chosen to exemplify this using Into the Jungle by Catherine Rundell, which is a beautiful book. I've chosen an extract which does demonstrate capital letters for names, places, and the personal pronoun I. So of course, I'd be reading this through with the children and what I'd want is to maybe identify them and maybe color code them to make those stand out. When I've done that, I'd obviously want the children to have a turn. So I might give them a piece of text where the capital letters have been displayed as lowercase. And I might get the children to do a paired read and give them the highlighters. Can they identify where the capital letters could be? And can they write above the correct capital letters? So that's a nice activity that you might do. Further activities, we might collect characters' names from texts and notice the use of capital letters. We might organise children's names under alphabet headings, which is the most capital letter to start a name in our class. Occasionally, we'll be missing out capital letters when we're doing a modelled right. And can the children identify and tell you where the capital letters should be? And I'm going to use capital letters for dramatic emphasis. I'm going to demonstrate how this should be read and find some examples in texts. I'm going to create labels for displays around the classroom that use capitals for emphasis. For example, do not touch hammy bites. And again, all the time, I'm adding those examples to that skills for life display so the children can use that as a reference point at every piece of writing. Another common error, and again, like me, you're probably getting a little bit fed up of seeing like the example in the picture of words that are actually plurals, but they've got for some reason an apostrophe popped in there, which is incorrect. So we need to make sure the children have got the correct subject knowledge. So when the noun is singular, the apostrophe goes before the S. For example, the lady's handbag. When the noun is plural and ends in an S, the apostrophe goes after the S. For example, the boy's changing room. As with most rules in the English language, there are exceptions. When the plural form of the noun is irregular and doesn't end in an S, the apostrophe goes before the S. For example, children's, women's and men's. So what's a useful thing to do is to think about the owners. Um, of these objects. So one game that I like to play is called Possessive Peg. And you can see from her face there, she does not like people using their possessions. So what I've got are some cards. You could use something similar. So I've got some dogs there, got some bowls. I've got some grass. And what I want the children to do is to hold up the right cards to match the sentence. And importantly, I have got my possessive peg. So you can see I've got an apostrophe on a peg here. And it's to help the children recognize the difference between plurals and possessives. So I might say, for example, the dogs played in the grass. Can you hold the cards up? The dogs played in the grass. Do we need possessive peg? Is there a possession that might get lost there? No, there isn't. Listen, the dogs played in the grass, and then I'd model writing that sentence up as a plural. Then I might say, the dog's bowl was full of food. The dog's bowl was full of food. Is there a possession there? Yes, there is. So along comes possessive peg, the dog's bowl. So again, I'd be writing down the dog, apostrophe S, the dog's bowl, was full of food. And then what I'm going to do is obviously leave my possessive pegs on the class tables or up on one stuck up on my working wall as a visual reminder that when the children are going back and editing their writing, they need to check, especially for their plurals and their possessive apostrophes. 
And then again, what of course I want to do is to apply that and over teach it within the context of my text within my unit. So again, back to Into the Jungle, I've got some um, examples here. So I've got Mowgli's hair was dark and shaggy, Shere Khan's tail flicked angrily, the cubs food was stored safely in the cave and of course I've thrown in a red herring there as well the elephants which is just a plural at the watering hole drank thirstily and again what I could do is print out those cards and have those for the children to hold up and do some of those sentences orally okay that's all for me it's over to Stephen take care Thank you, Catherine. As always, that was really helpful and useful and full of wonderful um, strategies and ideas for back in the classroom. I've already started making my possessive pegs because I love the idea of that game. I've got my tennis ball ready for the full stops activity. And I've also got a lovely pot of little full stops to use as well with the children so they can be really involved and active when we're practicing using those full stops as well. So thank you so much for those ideas. Um, as Catherine said, my name's Stephen Kenyon, and I'm also a teaching and learning consultant in primary English and history, and obviously one of Catherine's colleagues on the English team. And we've really enjoyed uh, preparing this vlog for you today. So hopefully you find it useful so far. I'm going to carry on now looking at those complex sentences we want children to use and the tricky punctuation they can sometimes trip up with, and also examine those, those sneaky little homophones that, again, children can make mistakes with and can be a common error. So without further ado, I'm going to carry on sharing our PowerPoint today and carry on with where Catherine left off. So brilliant. Just going to share from this slide. So we're going to be collecting and classifying some of these complex sentences. And we're going to have a look at some ING clauses from that wonderful story, Oliver Twist. So first thing we're going to do is find complex sentences within the story we're reading in class and underline the main clause in each one. So, have a look at this first sentence. I'm going to go at St. Heather as a class. Definitely going to do some Kung Fu punctuation. So, I've got my teacher microphone and some children microphones for them to use as well. So, let's say this together. Moving through the crowded London streets, dodge spied his chances to pick pockets. Hi, yeah. Brilliant. So we're going to read that and think, right, what's the, the main clause, the bit that makes sense by itself? And obviously, Dodger spied his chances to pick pockets. And also notice in that subordinate clause, um, that ING clause, moving through the crowded London streets. And obviously, separating the two is that comma. Another one. Assisting Oliver to rise, the young gentleman took him to an adjacent Chandler's shop. hi -ya. And one more. Taking the bread under his arm, the young gentleman turned into a small public house. Hi, yeah. So we've had a really good discussion about main and subordinate clauses, and we've been underlining those main clauses within our class novel. So we're going to carry on now collecting complex sentences, discussing them, obviously bobbing them onto our Skills for Life display, and then creating our own and editing them. So lots of children's examples to discuss as well. So let's read this little bit of text from the No Emporium which is one of our favourite year five, six texts. Um, I've tweaked it slightly for our purposes today. The shop was a cave of wonders. Everywhere Daniel looked, he saw something he wanted to pick up and have as his own. Silver and gold gleamed and sparkled in the light of a spitting fire. In a glass tank, tiny fish flashed like bars of copper. Eyeing the shop, a stuffed polar bear sat in one corner like a watchman. So the first thing we're going to do is to collect examples of subordinate clauses. So we notice here that in this sentence, we've got the main clause. Daniel saw something he wants to pick up and have as his own. We've also got that subordinate clause, which is separated by a comma. Everywhere he looked. OK. So I'm going to carry on now discussing how commas are used to demarcate complex sentences. So the children should now be able to tell us that the main clause is a stuffed polar bear sat in one corner like a watchman. And we've also got a subordinate clause um, eyeing the shot that is separated by a comma. And again, 
then we're going to use that Kung Fu punctuation to practice the rhythm, the tone and the intonation and the structure of this complex sentence. Off we go together. Eyeing the shop, a stuffed polar bear sat in one corner like a watchman. hi yeah, Absolutely brilliant. OK, now the next thing to do once we've collected and discussed is start to create our own. Now, obviously in the story, Daniel sees things he really wants and all the children will be able to relate to that. So what do the children really want and can they bob that into their sentence? So I'm going to start with everywhere he looked and make this about myself. So everywhere he looked, Stephen saw lots of books that he wanted to read. Hi, yeah. And then we'll say that together as a class with the children chanting it chorally. And then they will have a go at saying their own when they look around. So where do they go? Which toy shop do they go to and see things that they really want? Uh, and so we're going to verbally say our own sentences and then we're going to have a go at writing them down. So I'm going to go over to the flip chart. I'm going to say it again. So I need to hold that sentence in my memory and say it out loud before I write it down. Everywhere he looked, shh, Stephen saw lots of books that he wanted to read. Hi, yeah. And then I'm going to write that down onto the flip chart. And then the children will have a go at creating their own. And then we're going to move into editing. So I might look at my sentence. Do you know what? I've missed something out? Maybe I've missed the comma. Maybe I missed out that lovely adjective that the wonderful books I wanted to read. So I'm going to have a go just editing that sentence and just correcting it. You may even have an extra pupil in class, a teddy or a puppet. This is Grace. She's saying hello. And she sometimes makes mistakes with complex sentences and homophones. So we might look at Grace's writing and help her as well to correct it. OK, so then the children have a go at editing and correcting their own writing. Moving into homophones, brilliant. Now we know that children are learning to spell these correctly and distinguish between them in year two. And this is going to move through into year three, year four, year five, and then into year six. It's still a target to distinguish between homophones and other words that are often confused. <clears throat> so a homophone is a word that sounds the same as another, but is spelt differently. For example, male and male, two, two and two. It must be recognised that sound is not necessarily an indication of spelling. So we know that homophone means same sound, but obviously it's not necessarily the same spelling or the same meaning. And that's what can be tricky for children. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more depth. So we're going to teach, model and define these homophones. And here are some lovely whole class approaches that you could have a go with the children back in the classroom. So we've got the words two spelt T-W-O. So we're noticing the spelling of this homophone. And when it's spelt like that, two is a number. So we've got the spelling and also the meaning or definition of this homophone. Then we're going to give an example in context. So there were two goldfish in the bowl. OK. So moving forward uh, with this strategy, we need to teach the differences in meaning for common homophones that can cause these common errors. So we know that two, spot T-W-O, is always used as a number, but actually we can also spell two T-O. When it's spelt like that, it's a preposition, or T-double-O, and when it's spelt like that, it means more than enough or an excessive amount um, as well or also. So here we have T-double-O, and it means more than enough. OK, so it was too hot outside. There was more than enough heat, an excessive amount of heat. So we can practice that. Let's say that together with the children. It was too hot outside and put some emphasis in. And obviously at the moment, you know, we're not in the summer and it can always be too cold, couldn't it? So we could talk about an excessive amount of different things. It could be heat. It could be cold. And that is T double O. So as we're moving through this strategy, we might give children a simple sentence and ask them uh, to think what is missing, which version of two would complete this sentence. So he wanted to go home. He wanted to go home. So let's say it together and let's think about it. Is that a number? No, it's not the number two. It's not T-W-O. Um, is it about an excessive amount of something, too much of something? No, it's not. 
actually in this sentence we need two as a preposition and we know that when we use two as a preposition it's spelled t-o so we could say i am going to the beach and in this sentence he wanted to go home so we know it's t-o as a preposition brilliant okay let's move on so i'm going to start modeling asking some questions then is it a number is it more than enough of something is it a preposition children could work in pairs to discuss the correct choice in the context of a sentence so she bought two tomato pizzas is that a number goldilocks tasted the porridge it was too salty oh too much salt so which version of two do we need yes t double o brilliant okay so spelling homophones and near homophones we're going to teach the words and meanings directly and we're going to display them on our skills for life wall <clears throat> we could also place sticky notes over homophones in shared texts and ask children to work out which one fit so we've got this text it's massive it's either on the on the interactive whiteboard or on the flip chart and we've also got our post-it notes our handy post notes to use so dear emily i must tell you that a blue whale is much too big to live in your pond you're sincerely greenpeace so the whale is much too big um, just that we had too much heat or too much cold we've now got too much size the whale is much too big for the pond so thinking about our skills for life display we've got our it was too hot um poster we've made for the class on the wall so actually it's got to be t double o once again we're talking about more than enough of something so i can remove the sticky note there we have brilliant t double o the whale is much too big to live in your pond let's read that as a class dear emily i must tell you that a blue whale is much too big to live in your pond so spelling homophones and near homophones then the next strategy we could do is to create some individual class flashcards sorry for the children and ask them to hold up the correct spelling in response to a sentence in which the meaning is clear so they've got some flashcards with the different versions of two two and two that they can hold up um, and just demonstrate their understanding with those homophones another lovely strategy could be riddles so what opens locks and is always found besides water can they solve that riddle can they spell that can they select and spell that homophone correctly okay now obviously um you know i love books and everywhere i look i want to um to buy some books and read some books one of my favorites is the indian in the cupboard so i'm actually going to hunt for homophones within this key text and guess what i'm going to be hunting for there there and there and if you know me well you'll know that this is a real bugbear of mine that often when i was teaching children spelt these incorrectly um, on my singing title learning stick vlog I've, I've created some songs or shared some songs at least that we can use uh, with there 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 so let's dig in now to there there and there and again see if we can help the children spell them correctly use the correct one um, when they're hunting homophones within a text so Omri and Patrick spent many hours playing together with their joint collections of plastic toys so it's their toys the toys belong to them so it's obviously t-h-e-i-r and then we have another sentence from the novel the three boys used to play there and occasionally found treasures in this instance it's over there so we know it's going to be t-h-e-r-e -E. and finally one more sentence i'm going to use my kung fu punctuation for this one undoubtedly shh, there was something alive in that cupboard hi yeah brilliant and we know that it's in the cupboard it's over there um, and it's another t-h-e-r-e -E. brilliant so some key messages from today and we've got you know our purple polishing pens uh, we love editing writing don't we of course the first thing we're going to do is when we're marking the children's independent writing is to identify common errors so during that time you're marking the class's writing you're making some notes what is it that is coming up time and time again that i need to address with the whole class we're going to make a display for these things um, and we're going to display uh, we're going to display some bespoke skills for life prompts on the working wall to address key issues for our class we're going to model how to improve a piece of writing 
first so that children are well equipped to edit their own writing independently or with a partner. And then we're going to ensure that these non-negotiables, these skills for life, are used by children to edit every piece of writing in English and across the curriculum. So this is going to become a habit, this process. So we want it to be something that happens regularly in class. As teacher, we identify common errors, display them on the skills for life world and interact with them and learn about them. We're going to model as teacher how to use these homophones, these complex sentences, these capital S and full stops correctly. The children will then have a go at using them within their independent writing. And then obviously we will have trained them and taught them how to edit their work independently. You know, potentially having some kind of skills for life prompt that they can get maybe from a little help table in the classroom and check their writing. OK, so I hope you found that really useful today. So I'm just going to stop sharing the PowerPoint now. And um, I'm really excited with the thought of you taking some of these strategies and having a go at them in class to develop these skills for life so that children are getting these tricky things correct as they move through school and beyond. So on behalf of Catherine and myself, thank you for joining us in this vlog. And we look forward to hearing about your success teaching skills for life. So take care and stay safe.